Coming up next this week in computer hardware, will the R9290 290X take the Titan? G-Sync means variable refresh rates, Windows tablets, and oh yeah, new Apple gear. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 240, recorded October 24th, 2013. Has the Titan fallen? Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm your host, Patrick Norton, and this is the show on Twitch where we aim to bring you the best, most important, most useful, most informative news about computer hardware, tablets, occasionally something on the cell phone side of things, once in a while a phablet, and of course, we love the gaming, we love the speed, and we love servers, and we love parts, and we love upgrading PCs, but most of all, we love that our man, Ryan Shrout, made it back from Montreal, his hockey experience, and his drinking with NVIDIA in one piece. Did you get stopped at the border this time, man? Uh, no, actually, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> actually, coming back, this is the first time I'd used the electronic border patrol stuff before, where you just scan your passport, and it, like, takes a picture of your face, and then you present that printout to a border patrol agent, and they look at it and go, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And then kind of move <laughs> on. So it was pretty quick and painless. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Last time I went to Canada, they were just, I had way too much computer stuff in my bag and they wanted to know exactly why I had all that computer stuff and I had to explain I that was, I'm a geek and I travel I'm with always, a lot of computer I'm always stuff. surprised when we don't get stopped for that because uh, like this time we were carrying some video equipment with us and we had like a shotgun mic and a handheld microphone and some of those things that probably look odd under an x-ray machine when they're all kind of jumbled <laughs> and piled together. Um, the worst thing I did was forgetting that I had a laptop in my backpack and then in my carry-on suitcase, we had a right. high performance laptop for like video encoding and that kind of stuff and forgot to take that out and got a couple of questionable looks when it went through uh, the x-ray machine as well. Why did you start it? Why did you start it? I'll deal with questionable looks a lot better than I'll deal with a bunch of people running up towards me with, with guns drawn. <laughs> down, down, down. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, we should probably point out before we there's a lot of exciting news from NVIDIA stuff going on with uh, well, uh, the, the AMD Radeon R9 290X review that Ryan did over at PC Per. We might want to point out that there were some exciting announcements this week. Uh, six inch phablets from Nokia, uh, 22 or 2.2 gigahertz uh, Snapdragon processors, six inch screens, uh, the 1520 and the 1320. These are these sort of top of the line Windows phones or Windows phone, tablet, phablet things. Uh, they look gorgeous. The cameras have strong possibilities. Holy crap. As somebody who carries a Galaxy Note, I cannot imagine carrying around a six inch phone, at least not without a Bluetooth device of, of some type to support it. They also did uh, Nokia's first Windows tablet. And quite frankly, uh, the more I learn about um, Windows Surface and some of the other uh, tablets out there that are selling for hundreds of dollars, the more I want to try it when a Dell's Venue 8.1s uh, that are running Windows 8.1, uh, or excuse me, Dell Venues, 8-inch Dell Venues with Windows 8.1. Uh, and you might uh, remember that, uh, you might remember that uh, at the same time, that Microsoft was announcing or Microsoft Nokia or Nokia Microsoft or Nokia soft <laughs> was announcing uh, their new slate of Windows phones. Uh, a little company from California called Apple was talking about something called an iPad Air uh, and an iPad mini retina, uh, which oddly enough, uh, both share the exact same processor as the new iPhone 5S, uh, which is the A7. And I want to say the Air and the phone have the motion processor, but I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head if the iPad mini retina does. But it's an interesting lineup. Basically, like, whether you have an iPad Air, an iPad mini with retina, or a 5S, you're getting the same top-of-the-line uh, Apple redesigned ARM processor. So, Haswell MacBook Pros. And uh, UJ in the chat room said, Patrick, impressions of the new Mac Pro. It's freaking gorgeous. It is pushing the design of hardware forward, much like some routers uh, we've seen that are the sort of similar cooling tower shape where the stuff you need cooled is on the inside, the air flows through. There's a ton of external expansion. There is no internal expansion. Um, 
we've already had enough fun sort of teasing around that picture of the Mac Pro, uh, you know, the new cylinder of joy versus the, you know, with, with the pile of external drives around it. I think we've beaten that one to death. I think it's gorgeous. I think it's a fantastic piece of design and engineering. I'm really curious uh, who's going to buy them and what they're going to do with them. Because everybody know, I know who runs Final Cut Pro got so pissed off at the old Mac Pros. They built Hackintoshes rather mm. than pay way too much for Apple's hardware, um, not to slag Apple. And then a lot of the people who are using Final Cut Pro are so frustrated with Apple's relative lack of interest in Final Cut Pro development that they moved on to Premiere. Not all of them, but a fair number of them. So sure. I'm, I'm curious who's going to buy them. It's $3,000. It's a lot of hardware. <laughs> But it's still three thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, I, I think fifteen. You know, fifteen. You know, how how much of that is hardware and how much of that is magnificent design and engineering? Um, all. <laughs> all. It's all everything. It's they all would never everything. Bring down prices for you? Of course not. Um, you know, and and Brian and I don't actually talk a lot of smack about the pricing these days. On certainly the Mac laptops are are fairly in line. I mean, you, you, there's a little Mac premium, but not a brutal sure. one. Yeah. Um, not like it was in the back of the day, but I mean. You know, you look at the Mac Pro specs and, hey, it's Xeon processors. Why? Oh, yeah, to, you know, basically put a bigger bump between it and the iMacs. I mean, right. uh, you know, and, and the MacBook Pros. Um, you know, I just, I think the Xeon processors aren't particularly useful. Um, you know, I'm fine with DDR3. You know, the Fire Pros, I'd be real, I mean, I'd love to know. Obviously, I, I'm sure... Don't get me wrong. Apple knows what it's doing. They're specking these these systems out for their particular market. But it's like, you know, I, I kind of feel like they could have gone with slightly less expensive hardware and gotten most of the performance. On the flip side, they're like, hey, we're going to support six Thunderbolt displays or three 4K displays, you know. And with the market they're doing, it's probably going to be, you know, three of those beautiful monitors that Ryan will eventually have pried out of his hands. He has one, the 4K monitor from Asus. <laughs> oh, wait, it's going to be an Apple 4K monitor. Where's the Apple 4K monitor, actually? But it's beautiful. Uh, I would happily take one if somebody wants to buy me one, but hmm. I, I, I can't justify anything remotely close to that price. But I'm not doing huge engineering applications, and I'm not sort of a serious photo editor, and I don't edit video for a living. Although everybody know who does, again, built Hackintoshes. So probably more than we should talk about uh, the Apple announcement at this point, since it's practically last year, uh, it being on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> but since we've gone from being behind, let us go to being too far ahead, uh, although it's practically Halloween and, and Costco has been ready for Christmas for at least three weeks. Let's talk about it. NVIDIA's holiday gaming bundle Free games, people. What do I got to buy to get a free game from NVIDIA, Ryan? Uh, well, obviously, you have to <laughs> buy video cards uh, to get free games. Um, so that it's kind of interesting. Like a video card on the right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's not that's not part of what you have to buy. That's part of what the deal is. So um, if you buy a GTX 780, 770, or a GTX Titan, you'll get uh, Splinter Cell, Batman Origins, which comes out uh, tomorrow, today, if you're listening to this after the fact, and Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, and you'll get $100 off an NVIDIA Shield device. Uh, if you buy a 760 or below or one of the 600 series cards, you get Splinter Cell, Assassin's Creed, and $50 off of the Shield device. So it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a hell of a game bundle just on its own. Splinter Cell, Batman, Assassin's Creed, all three very good games. Um, it's interesting to see that currently running amd has no bundles now nvidia is going to start these on monday so uh it's you know kind of a swapping of positions in that case and they're really trying to push the shield um they talked about at the event in uh montreal about hey here's game stream we're going to let you hook your shield up to your tv and then use it in console mode they they're going to take the pc game streaming feature out of beta uh, so that you'll be able to stream more games through your PC to your Shield in your house, that kind of thing. So they're they're, they're trying to to talk up more of the features, how this is a differentiating thing, how they can create this kind of obviously NVIDIA branded hardware ecosystem that all kind of works together. Uh, but even if you take that out of the picture, I think Shield is still today two ninety nine. So you get a hundred bucks off. You can get it for two hundred dollars. 
It's a pretty good device in terms of the amount of hardware you get for 200 bucks, but it is still primarily an Android gaming machine, gaming device. Uh, and they're, you know, it's, it's, it's how much value you would put in the PC features of it. So uh, it, it's kind of cool, uh, but the bundle is, is pretty good. Uh, so you have to deal with that if you're looking at making graphics cards decisions in addition to everything else that's happened this week. So let's take a moment to move on to a slightly different subject. Not that uh, Minecraft 1.7.1 launches on Friday, um, but G-Sync, Variable Refresh Rate Monitor Technology. Um, I am fascinated so, and terribly confused by this. So let me see if I can explain <laughs> it um, fairly easily. I, there's actually okay. an article that I wrote called uh, NVIDIA G-Sync Death of the Refresh Rate that kind of talks about a lot of the history of refresh rates, why they exist, why they don't need to exist, and what NVIDIA is attempting to change. But let me see if I could kind of sum it up um, for the show here. As it stands today, you, I'm assuming most people know what a refresh rate it is. It is the rate at which a monitor will display a new image on the screen, right? And you've got most monitors today are 60 hertz refresh rates. That means 60 times a second. You've got 120 hertz, and there are even some 144 hertz panels out there today. Now, what's interesting to think about is that you essentially have a rate match problem, whereas the, the rate at which the monitor displays images is fixed, and mm -hmm. the rate at which the game, in, the computer produces um, uh, uh, rendered frames is variable. And they don't match up. Very rarely do they match up. Only in a very in a, like a perfect V like VSync enabled right. setup, right? So, the basic idea of of G Sync is to take the power, uh, take the decision of when to display a new frame away from the monitor and give it to the graphics card, so that the graphics card basically tells the monitor, "Hey, I'm done with this frame. Now you show it." And then as soon as it is done with the next frame, it does the same thing. So you get a variable refresh rate on a display, which has never really happened before, except when you turn off VSync. And if you are a PC gamer and you, and you have played around with VSync on or VSync off in your games, you know what the difference is. With VSync off, you get these horizontal tears, right? Where the monitor is, yeah, like that. You, the monitor is painting an image on the screen, but halfway through that image, the buffer on the uh, on the on the graphic card actually changes and so it starts to read from a different frame now this gives you better input latency improved input latency it gives you uh, faster response times in the game but you get these visual anomalies the other option is standard vsync which you don't get any of those visual tears but now you are limited to a static refresh rate you either run at 60 frames per second on your game or if there's a performance hit and your game uh, renders at less than 60, suddenly you have to drop all the way down to 30 because that is the next divisor of 60 that is, you know, is going to allow it to paint a full, full uh, image on the screen. So G-Sync will let you, if your game at that instant is running at 50 frames per second, mm -hmm. it's going to show you 50 images on the monitor at a time, or 50 images on the monitor per second without visual tearing, without horizontal tearing. If it's running at 30, it'll do that. If it's running at 40, it'll do that. And if it goes up to 60, it'll do that. And now this monitor that they picked to kind of be the pilot for G-Sync is like an Asus 144 hertz. So, you know, you you anywhere between 30 and 120, probably 144, you'll be able to have this variable refresh rate where you'll get um, fast response times, no uh, delay in your input, and no horizontal tearing in your screen. And, it, and it's, it was one of those things, I saw it in person on, on last Friday in Montreal, where universally every media member that I talked to that saw it, that demoed it, uh, came away incredibly impressed. Um, <laughs> they brought John Carmack and Tim Sweeney and Johan Anderson, uh, who did the Battlefield, who does the Battlefield engine, um, the Frostbite engine and Tim Sweeney, who did the uh, Unreal engine, all on stage together where they talked about G-Sync, among other topics, talking about this just makes sense. This is how things should be going forward. This is, you know, one of those, duh, why didn't we fix this as an industry 10 years ago type mm -hmm. of thing. So it's 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 really, really, really compelling technology. Um, so I, does that does that make more sense now? 
Yeah, I, I think part of it's like you will have to have a compatible monitor. You can't yep. update older monitors. Um, you know, is NVIDIA going to make the technology allow this to work free to monitor manufacturers? How do I test the sort of, you know, the the the, the gray to gray, um, mm -hmm. you know, panel time? Is that something that's going to be set at the factory as, as part of the... Uh, uh, as part of the 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 mod, you know what I mean? There's, it's 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 interesting, right? Because it's so, it's funny. It, it's it's funny when you realize, like, hey, you know, 50 hertz and 60 hertz uh, multiples are there basically because of electricity, uh, right? Because CRTs back in you know the Stone yeah. Age didn't function well if there weren't multiples of those. But um, it's so you know, like, there will be new monitors that are coming out. If you have this specific Asus 144 hertz, I think it's the VG248QE, I think. I think that's the right model number. They're actually going to sell an upgrade kit for it where you replace um, the controller board in it. Um, so that's that's kind of how they're getting this out to, to gamers as soon as they can. Um, they're not going to give it away for free. It's definitely like you have to have, you're going to have to have an NVIDIA GeForce graphics card and you're going to have to have a uh, a G-Sync enabled monitor. I think they've they've announced partnerships with Asus, BenQ, ViewSonic, and one other who I am drawing a blank at uh, Philips. So those are big names in the in the display field. The, the The main drawback for me at this point is that it's lim there are only 1080p monitors that they're talking about right now. So I have been, and I know you have as well, kind of pushing people right. like, hey. The next big step is go get that 2560 by 1440 display mm -hmm. because the next step after that is going to be 4K displays. And this technology, while really, really awesome, is kind of is right now limited to 1080p. Uh, it, there's no reason it has to be limited to 1080p other right. than these are the monitors that are going to come with that technology first. So I, I believe that this will be a technology that is adopted over a long period of time that will be very, very successful. But, but it's the downside for NVIDIA is it's something you have to see in person to really understand. We did a live stream. Right. Tom Peterson from NVIDIA came here and we sat down and we had two of these monitors out on our desk, one with G-Sync enabled, one without. And for a couple of hours before the stream actually went live, we kept looking at it. And it's like, when we when record, you're recording a variable frame rate with a fixed frame rate camera, it's being encoded to a slightly different fixed frame rate going out over stream. You, you, it's not possible to see the difference in real time through cameras or video of any kind. So it's, it's one of those problems that they're going to have selling a product, convincing people that, they, that there's a difference that they need it without being able to actually go you know, to a Fry's or a micro center or something like that and actually watch it and get a demonstration in person. I was going to say that's what end caps are for. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's, it's really cool stuff, though. Like, you know, they, they obviously had a demo that's set up. Here's the worst case scenario. Your game is running at 45 frames per second. Right. Here's the artifacts you see if you have V-Sync on. You get this these kind of unsmooth cadences of the animation of like a swinging pendulum. If you turn V-Sync off, it's, a, it, it's not more smooth, but now you have visual tearing. And then you turn it on uh, the G-Sync mode, and it, just, and it just works. And having done research for that article I was talking about, uh, on death of the refresh rate, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I did not know about why refresh rates were what they were, why LCD monitors today still dictated to the computer right. a refresh rate at all, because there's nothing inherently in the technology that makes it fixed anymore. It used to be with CRTs that was the time it took the uh, electron beam gun to move back up to the top of the right. screen, draw it and draw and move back up to the top of the screen. So that's not really a problem anymore. It's just <laughs> legacy, um, you know, legacy kind of statement. ideology keeping us in place. You know, part of me wants to like, you know, part of me is envisioning like, you know, 140 hertz monitors for everyone. And part of me is also going, man, by the time, you know, it's, it's, I'm curious if the re, you know what the refresh rates will be at the higher resolution monitors and 4K because uh, I, I think we both agree that once you've experienced 4K as a desktop, you want 4K right. as a desktop. And at the moment, you know 4K is stuck at 30 hertz. It'll be at 60 hertz next year. Um, but even even on a, even on a 60 hertz panel, this still makes right. improvements, right? It okay. really does um, because especially at 4K. 
which is a situation where even with the best hardware today, you're very, very unlikely going to be crossing 60 frames per second for your game time. And so right. your options are, do I run in V-Sync and have a clean image in terms of no horizontal tearing, but I have slow uh, frame rates down to 30, drop me all the way down to 30, or I get these kind of weird stutters, or do I turn on, uh, turn off V-Sync and have the horizontal tearing associated with it? <laughs> and if they had a monitor with that capability at 4K resolution, you wouldn't have to kind of make that uh, sacrifice or that decision one way or the other. It would just work the way it should be. I think if you sat down today and took all of the existing infrastructure away and said, how should computers work with, or how should, how should content work with a display? It should be, well, the display, the content should say, hey, put a frame on the screen, put a frame on the right. screen, right? It's the same reason why we had to invent things like 3-2 pull down for yeah, I was going to say there's a someone uh, on TV. Untoward the chats like 120 Twitter 40 hertz TVs for the latency and overprocessing. They manufacture tween frames, and I just want more data on the screen being beamed to my eyes. Well, part of the problem is movies are shot at 24 frames per second, um, which creates all sorts of issues. And when you go to a modern uh, uh, film, it stops looking like, or I should say, modern digital you know technique. It's it starts looking funny because we're used to the judder, the stutter of film is part of what we expect to experience when we're, when we're watching them. Um, so will they open it up to AMD to try to make this Indian industry standard or is it going to be an NVIDIA premium? It just seems it's, like, I, mean, it, I should say actually uh, more importantly, maybe than AMD opened it up to Intel. Uh, if they, if they want it to become a, an industry standard, wouldn't they want to open it up to Intel and well, AMD, so that there is an incredible motivation for monitor manufacturers to get on board? So while I would love for that to happen, <laughs> NVIDIA is a company <laughs> that is obviously in a place of some difficulty uh, where, you know, Intel has graphics and processor, AMD has graphics and processor, NVIDIA as, a, as an organization needs to prove its value, needs to prove that, that its upgrade path is still viable. And I think this is one of those features um, that will help with that, right? So I do not expect them to open this up to try to make it an, uh, an industry standard or open it up to AMD or license it to anybody um, in, in that way. I, I think it would be, I think what you'll probably see is AMD take like the, the same stance they have with other standards like this, where they take a, an open initiative response, right? Oh, we're going to create something like this and, you know, kind of like 3D vision versus what they did with the HD 3D. Um, the, the, the difference will be how how much weight they put behind it. If they can get Intel involved, that'd be awesome. But I don't think AMD wants to work with Intel. So all these companies kind of want to work by themselves, but they kind of want to make industry standards. So they're always caught in this kind of loop. And I'm sure even internally, there are people at the company that are like, Let, let's make this easy to get. Let's make this uh, something that uh, it will be accessible to everybody. And there are others that are like, no, how about we keep it for ourselves? Because it's going to drive up our market share and, and, and get you know, people really excited around that GeForce brand. So there's, I, I, as much as I would like to see it, I don't think so. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Quick comment from the chat room. John R. Weird Ami, I hate the fact that home theater gurus tell you that you want to watch all your movies in 24 hertz. Well, first of all, it's on 24 hertz to 24 frames per second. And we're not telling you that. It's just the vast majority of people who experience movies and in, that have been reprocessed into higher frame rates, a little upset with the results. But uh, you may enjoy the soap opera effect on your movies, and that is okay. You turn that processing on. Uh, not okay. <laughs> Josh Walworth, uh, who was kind enough to host in, in Ryan's absence last week. Yep. Next-gen graphics and process migration, 20 nanometers and beyond. And I think he kind of hinted on it last week. Uh, but the article is pretty blunt. The really good times are over. We really do not realize how good we had it. Sure, we could apply that to budget surpluses in the time before the rise of global terrorism. But in this case, I am talking about the predictable advancement of graphics due to both design expertise and the improvements in process technology. Moore's Law has been exceptionally kind to graphics. We can look back when we plot the course of these graphics companies. They have actually outstripped more in terms of transistor density from generation to generation. Most of this is due to better tools and the expertise gained in what is still a fairly new endeavor as compared to CPUs. The first true 3D accelerators were released in the 93-94 time frame. I remember holding them in my grubby little hands. Um, 
I mean, is it are, are we doomed in terms of, of process advancements on uh, for for GPUs at this point, Ryan? Because I'm I'm sure Josh talked about this a little more at length last night. Yeah, you know, it's a really complicated subject, and I sure. I, I think that his his main point is that it, it, it's the the free lunch is done right. Not that there won't be innovation going forward, but that the ability to get stuff easily is 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 going away and i think we we can see that pretty clearly from the 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 lack of the, the slow movement from 28 to 20 nanometer um on the graphics side as well as another other soc so you know i i think that the, the points he makes are, are are pretty clear he he makes an analogy to what happened at the 130 nanometer scale where there was a uh, a big jump in innovation and we, we've seen all these advancements and it was I th even John Carmack talked about it last week where he said, you know, since he started programming, there was a um, six orders of magnitude of compute performance improvement, right, which is something that you'll probably never see again uh, because of some of these process limitations unless somebody comes up with something completely new uh, mm -hmm. in terms of quantum computing or anything like that. Uh, that we're kind of going to be in a rut of uh, slower, uh, more expensive innovation. And the problem is, is as innovation becomes more expensive, less people want to do it, which means there's less competition, which means there's less desire to even to innovate uh, in that field. So uh, I, it's a really good read. If you have any interest in, even if you don't have interest in process technology, if you like the history of why things maybe appear to be slowing down, why it has, t why it took this long for AMD to release a new graphics architecture um, compared to, you know, the last decade of iterative releases almost every six months. Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely worth a read. I check it out. AMD Radeon R9 290X Hawaii review taking on the Titans. I think somewhere around here, I saw a title somewhere on pcpro.com. Where was it? Where is it? Fall of a Titan got the R9 290X. Yeah. <laughs> that that was Jeremy. Take your thunder away. <laughs> I can't claim that one. Jeremy wrote that title. Shouldn't that have been like, you know, can the R9 290X beat the Titan? So I'd click on that link. I mean. So uh, the R9 290X is Hawaii. It's the new GPU that uh, we, that was announced a few weeks ago when I was at the Hawaii Tech Day. And it's just kind of now coming out. Um you know the 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 kind of long and short of it is it is a faster single GPU card than anything AMD has today. It's got twenty eight hundred over twenty eight hundred stream processors in it, um, which is like thirty seven percent more than the seventy nine seventy or the R nine two eighty X, whatever you want to call it. Um, the architecture is tweaked just a little bit in a couple of key areas. Uh, but nothing really dramatic. It's still based on the same GCN architecture that the last generation of graphics cards was based on. That's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, kind of referencing back to that story um, that Josh was talking about, or that Josh wrote rather, about kind of the slowdown of innovation. This is one of those instances of a result of that. But still, you're getting 37% more uh, processors. You're getting... Um, 20, but let's see what it was. If you go to the bottom here, you're getting 30% more uh, theoretical compute power. And uh, you're in doing that by while also improving the, the efficiency of the die. So you're getting more performance per millimeter squared of die, which is important, right? Because you're trying to keep power down. You're trying to keep costs down while also innovating and bringing new performance parts. So uh, the, the R9-290X, is I, I think it's fair to say faster than the GTX 780 and pretty much on par, maybe a little bit faster, just barely than the uh, GTX Titan graphics card. And that's important because the uh, R9 290X is a $550 card while the 780 is 650 bucks and the Titan is $999. So uh, it's still a high-end enthusiast offering for sure, mm -hmm. in terms of its kind of pricing and segmentation, but it is a hundred dollars less than the 780 that it does beat fairly regularly, fairly handily in some cases, 
uh, just in our game testing at 1080p and at 2560 by 1440. Right. So AMD has done, uh, done a good job of developing a part that has a performance advantage and they're, they're pricing it accordingly. They're, or they're rather they're pricing, it, pricing it aggressively as opposed mm -hmm. to kind of settling it into a slot, which as consumers you should like, even if you don't want to buy this card, this will, I mean, NVIDIA will have to push down prices of the GTX 780. Uh, I don't know about the Titan, but at least the GTX 780 to match what the, the R9 290X is doing. Right. Uh, and that's, that's good news. Now the, the chip is hotter. It uses more right. power. The fan is louder. There's, there are some other things that aren't great about the card. It's not a perfect <laughs> release uh, for sure, but it's spend the hundred dollars you save on the Titan for a, <laughs> for a water cooling system <laughs> you know the, i i think um aftermarket designs you know the retail card designs with the with the new coolers will be they could be a big plus for this design because the they, they've also changed how the clocks work with power consumption and um the clock rates are now very dynamic in my testing i've seen clock speeds range from the upper 600s to the mid 900s for regular gaming scenarios. That's a huge, huge variance. Uh, and they're also getting, they're also pushing this. Yeah, there you go. They're also pushing the temperature of this GPU up to 95 Celsius. Uh, and that is by design. That is not an accident. Um, AMD claims that, hey, we've done our testing. This is safe. Uh, this is where, you know, we're comfortable taking this GPU. But at 95C, you know, they basically, uh, uh, pull up the clocks until you hit 95 degrees Celsius and they start to pull it back down and vary your voltage and vary your clock speed so you never really cross that 95C range, which is good because right. you, there's not a whole lot more headroom above 95 degrees Celsius for these types of chips. Um, you know, it, it's it's not great. So the, the noise is higher, significantly higher. Uh, power consumption is a little bit higher. But, you know, luckily for... Well, I don't really, I, I hate to kind of just generalize like this, but a lot of enthusiasts are more worried about performance per dollar than they are performance per DBA of sound or performance right. per watt, right? They're, they're okay, you know, with running a little bit hotter, a little bit louder because they turn up their speakers or they're using headphones. Um, so it, it, I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to performance per dollar. That's the most important metric uh, uh for these cards and the the r9 290x did pretty well uh and the second part of it we wrote a different piece uh that looked at crossfire and 4k mm -hmm. and crossfire scaled very well keep in mind this is the first card with the new crossfire Bridges. implementation doesn't use a bridge uh it's not a chip but doesn't use a bridge across the multiple cards uh, it has no connector there. All the data communicates now through the PCI Express bus. Um, and that's that's an old graph, actually, Burke, uh, from uh, a while ago. But the uh, the results are good. They have, you know, Crossfire still works in single monitor configurations with these cards. And which was the big issue in September for us um, was that the uh, uh, multi-head and iFinity Crossfire configurations appear to be drastically improved with the R9 290X as well, which means those 4K 60 hertz displays, um, mm -hmm. you'll be able to run Crossfire without the problems of drop frames and run frames, which is a, a big advantage for somebody who's looking to spend a thousand something dollars on video cards and $3,000 right. on a monitor. So it's not perfect. It's not. It's still not as good as what NVIDIA has with SLI, but they, they have proven that it's working and they've made... Uh, you know, drastic improvements in in Crossfire in that way. So, pretty Three much cheers. all good news across the board for AMD on this release. Yay! Go AMD! <laughs> Keep the competition alive. Yeah, you can always email us twitch t w i c h at twit tv at Ryan Shrout on Twitter or at Patrick Norton on Twitter. Um, we have uh, not a lot of questions from the chat room today, but we have questions that were sent into Twitch, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv, including this missive from Johnny Booth on HDCP and low-cost displays. He says, after much deliberation, I finally joined the 2560 Club and ponied up for a Korean monitor, which is nothing short of amazing. Being the miser I am, I priced watch like a hawk and sold anything that wasn't nailed down until I found a great deal <laughs> and had enough cash for it. 
while being almost totally fixated on price. I forgot all about HDCP support. I have an HD Home Run Prime, which I use to watch my cable channels. Cord cutting coming soon. Join me in the promised land. While I don't watch TV often on my main system, I was wondering, is there any workarounds or inexpensive devices that I could use? Any and all input is appreciated. Love all your shows. Thank you, Johnny Booth. Uh, are these monitors not HDCP compliant? Question mark. As in, will they not play Blu-ray or other uh, locked down HDMI content or content? So I think HDMI. some of them are and some of them aren't. So keep, like, so some of them. Here, here's here's some of these monitors only have a dual link DVI input. Some of them have scalers. They have component and HDMI and, and that kind of stuff. But some of them only have dual link DVI. And my guess is the ones that are dual link DVI only probably don't have HDCP just as like a cost cutting measure really. And um, so that means that even if you have an adapter, you know, to, to, you know, even convert it to HDMI and connect it to like an actual HDCP source, I don't think it'll work. Um, I don't... <laughs> I don't know what to do. So he's this is this is this is different than the questions we normally get because more, you know what I normally get from users is hey how do I break through HDCP and do something I'm not supposed to do? This question is how can I add in something to uh, enable HDCP so that I can watch this content? And well, I honestly don't know if there's an answer to that. There have been. It's kind of funny. Uh, it's funny you should mention this because I was just talking about a a uh, I just got the word on a two port HDMI chip that got around uh, HTCP. There's a company called HD Fury uh, that's been around for a while. Um, and it's frustrating because essentially the we we bought to try out in the studio, right? Because um, in many cases, consoles have HDCP applied for reasons no one understands. Hint, they play Blu-rays. Um, yeah. And it's left on during the gaming, so it makes it really hard to capture gaming content. So we ended up with a um, we ended up with one of these, you know, bizarre accidental two channel switches that allowed you to output HDCP content, even though it would work with non HDCP monitors or capture devices. Um, that was sort of, uh, luck. Um, hdfury.com is a company that specializes in editors, um, if you take a look at their websites, uh, you know, you're looking at like $400, um, yeah, wow, they're like up to $400 uh, for their adapters. I'm trying to think if there's an inexpensive one. Um, mm. doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, what they call them HCCP strippers or HCCP converters. Um, you know, it's, uh, man, hmm. I'm not seeing... I may have I to look into those anyway for <laughs> capturing PS4 and Xbox One games, but... Yeah. Well, hmm. they certainly have a lot of devices, and it's expanded. I apologize. I did not see that question uh, in pre-show. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know if we'd even have an answer, and it was something where I was going to try to solicit to the viewers about what do you do if you are on a display that doesn't have... Uh, HDCP enabled and it's I'm trying to it's been a long time since I've had a panel I think the very very first 30 inch monitor I had did not have HDCP HDCP support so mm -hmm. like couldn't play back DVDs on and windows and that kind of stuff which was that's it's like a very odd thing to think about um, um but well it's funny because we we run into it some I wonder if their doctor HDMI would do it we'll have to we will have yeah. to research this some more and revisit it. Um, and if anybody, anybody listening, uh, send us an email, twitch at twit.tv uh, with, with your solutions or answers to that. I'm, I'm very curious both personally and for uh, our question asker, uh, Johnny, yeah. about I mean, what he can do for that. It's funny. Because he's, there are trying, a lot of... he's trying to follow the rules. He just, you know. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's legit. There are actually also a lot of older um, rear and then and projectors uh, and some very early HCTVs that That's don't properly implement HCCP, which is one of the reasons the HC Fury came out. Um, but the the company that sort of it, yeah, it's it is a long and ugly discussion that I will not get into right now. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, 
Got an email from Cooley about a display for the Xbox One. He says, what kind of monitor do you recommend for the Xbox One? Is there a specific brand or model that's right for it? I want to get the most out of the Xbox One when I get it. Thank you. <coughs> well, you want a gaming-friendly monitor, one that has uh, a game mode and preferably one uh, that is very, very low in latency. So that if you turn on all of the post-processing, we've, we've seen... Uh, when you look at latency testing, you can get up as high 100, 180, 240 milliseconds on some of the heavily processed modes for some television. Um, you know, but it's it's going to be 1080p. Uh, I would recommend something in the 45, uh, 44, 45, 60 inch range. If I uh, somehow con my wife into letting me have a console in the house, we're going to be using it on a 120 inch uh, projected screen uh, from a $600 Optoma projector that I've had for years. But you want to Sounds pretty good. Uh, you know, uh, we talk about it on AC Nation all the time. There's some great monitors from Samsung, from LG, from Panasonic. Um, uh, you know, and most of the monitors that are going to be released for the year are out. And we've seen some monitors starting at, you know, $500 for a 44-inch, 46-inch uh, flat panel that look fantastic. But mostly you want low latency. Uh, you want enough HDMI inputs to to handle all of your devices. And anything that will do a good job with movies, as long as the latency and gaming mode is low, uh, mm -hmm. will do great. I would also say you want a full set of surround sound speakers. I mean, ideally for me, yeah. I, would want a freaking, I would want my projector. I want a wall of video. I want a full-on surround sound system. And I'm running a Denon amplifier and a really nice set of Kef speakers. And that, that for me, is the full-on uh, gaming experience that I want is – a giant ass screen uh, and and full surround sound and my children to be off at, at the playground uh, <laughs> and not in the house because the noises from the games probably scare the hell out of them. So I uh, hope that helps you out a little bit, Cooley. But yeah, any any flat panel you got is a good start. And if you're buying a new flat panel, um, we've made a ton of recommendations uh, uh, on uh, AC Nation. I can I can send you in that direction. Do we have time for one more question, or do you have to run before you pass yeah, out? Yeah, let's do sir? one more. Yeah. And also, wow, I just realized uh, I did not plug in my power supply, so my battery is actually down to 15 minutes remaining. <laughs> All right, we'll make this. We'll we'll make this the last question then. <laughs> All right. Mel's got a question about missing graphics card. He says, I am not a rich man. By decree of my wife and daughter, I am not allowed to purchase the new hotness video card every three months. I'm running a four gigabyte version of the Asus GTX 680. My intention was to frugally future proof by adding on another four gig 680 and SLI sometime later. The price went down. But lo and behold, this version of the card is no longer available on Newegg. My question to you is this. Would there be any known problems with running a 4 gig 680 with a standard 2 gig 680 and SLI? Could you please test this configuration and report back to me before I attempt this? I only ask because I love and trust you both and also because I do not want to do another major upgrade until, let's say, 2016 or until quantum computers are commercially available. Thanks for working so hard. I'm a dedicated viewer of this live show. And thank you, Mel. These are very kind words. Um, Brian. Uh -oh. So I looked. New egg. <laughs> what? That, that, that I, sigh. That sigh is never good news. Well, I, I was surprised. I guess so. There are still lots of 680s for sale, but the four gigabyte was kind of a niche of the 680, so they kind of went away first. Um, right. I did find an ASUS. He didn't say which one he has. I found the ASUS Direct CU2 OC edition. The GTX 680, that's 389 bucks um, on Amazon. That's on Amazon Prime, $389, which is about where I would have expected the price to be. Uh, it's like $10 less than a reference GTX 770, which is a very similar card. The only problem for uh, the old, well, here, let me put this in the, uh, in the show notes here at the end of that question, because the only problem is, is that this, graphics card is a three slot behemoth of a graphics card right. and it's very likely that you may not have room for this <laughs> in your system now if you do here's your solution um you can get a four gigabyte oh i'm sorry that's a two gigabyte version never mind the four gigabyte uh -oh. ones are 579 dollars which is way too much for a uh, 680 never mind i put the wrong link in <laughs> okay, maybe maybe you're out of luck, I guess. Um, the doomed. the good news is is if you put a two gigabyte version in, you can st it'll still work, but you will lose the advantage of the four gigabytes 
of memory on the other card. Uh, it is, you know, when you run SLI or Crossfire with slightly different cards, they always kind of fall back to the maximum performance of the least powerful card. So mm -hmm. you will essentially be running two GTX 680s and two gigabyte frame buffer mode instead of four gigabyte frame buffer mode. Okay. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's unfortunate. That's, you know, you're losing 50% of the memory on one of your cards, but uh, depending on what resolution you're gaming at 1080p or 2560, I still think you'll, you'll see the advantage of, uh, uh, of, of SLI more than that would more than make up for the lack of losing that two gigabytes of frame buffer, I guess. Unless he goes to like multiple monitors or one of the higher resolution monitors, question mark? Um, yeah, I mean, there are advantages to four gig frame buffer or anything over two when you get into the higher resolution monitors. Uh, we, we saw that with, you know, GTX 780s getting three gigs of memory and even the Titan having six gigs of memory and the new type, the AMD Radeon R9 290X has four gigs of memory. There's definitely room for improvement on the frame buffer side, but if you're, if you're gaming at 1080p, this is not a problem. And if you're gaming at 25 by 14, I, st I still think it's not a problem with the exception of a couple of games where you may not be able to run things at maximum settings. You have to like uh, Bioshock Infinite is surprisingly one that if you run it ultra with the two gig frame buffer, you get a significant amount of uh, hitching and stuttering. But if you just right. pull back a couple of those settings, it's, it's not going to be a problem. So uh, I, I think look for a good deal on a GTX 680. If it's two gig, that's fine. And uh, I still think you'll see pretty dramatic performance improvements. One last thought before we go. Apex says, thanks, Patrick. I picked up the Monoprice headphones last week. He's in the chat room. Very surprising audio, even compared to my Audio Technica and Biodynamic headphones. And we're talking about the 8323s from Monoprice, uh, which cost three bucks and sound, well, $23.20. Uh, they have the worst ear pads ever. They have vinyl ear pads, and they're a yeah. little strange in terms of the head bracket, but they sound fantastic. Uh, I, 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 I've, I've listened to those, you know, they, they do a detachable cable. They come with two cables in the box. Uh, I would have not have been surprised if those, if those had been priced at like $75, um, they sound really, really good. Uh, and if you need an inexpensive set of headphones, uh, I can highly recommend those, uh, monoprice.com is probably the best place to get them cheap. And, uh, yeah, just the and uh, I got to say, I'm going to, before my, my laptop runs out of power, I'm going to call an end to this, uh, this episode of Twitch this week, computer hardware. Uh, PCPer.com, anything exciting coming up next week? Uh, so next week, I'm going to be in San Jose for this, the first part of the week for the ARM TechCon. So uh, there'll be some interesting news coming out of there. And what would a week be without another new graphics card release, Patrick? Another... <laughs> another new graphics card release so look forward to that next week too we would be confused and sad <laughs> oh my goodness i'm gonna be talking about uh, mid pc gaming builds uh we may find out that veronica has a new ipad we won't know until monday and i'm pretty sure i'm gonna to have to break down and replace the glass on an ipad 2 in the near future though that may be on a special uh a special youtube only show or or uh, Texilla daily show um let me tell you something. Replacing the glass on an iPad 2 is a wicked rip and pain in the posterior. And, yeah, uh, I hope yeah. you never, I hope, yeah, it's just, <sighs> I'll, I'll tell you when the video is posted. You can All see. Right. I'm just saying microwave, little tiny bits of glass, a lot of irritation. <laughs> and with that. Uh, just one last reminder twit.tv slash twitch is the place to find all our episodes if you're new to the show you can subscribe you can download you can stream uh, we recommend you do all three at once if you're into that kind of thing uh, pcper.com is Ryan's home on the internet I am at techzilla.com and that's it for this episode of twitch I'm Patrick Norton I'm Ryan Schreck we'll see you next week on twitch <laughs> <laughs>